Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm joined by Doug Ramsey of the Luthol Group coming to us from Minneapolis. We'll talk a little bit of market history and talk about the improvement in breadth conditions. Is that a good thing or a bad thing for stocks? As narrow leadership, the big names continue to do just fine. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the action in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. Technical Toolkit was really created to empower investors to have an edge. The robber barons in the 1920s and so and uh, and such sort of controlled everything. What's the individual investor going to do? Uh, traders like Gann, like Jesse Livermore, famously applied some of these basic concepts of analyzing supply and demand, really analyzing investor emotion, uh, fear and greed, and quantifying those. And that has evolved into the modern practice of technical analysis. What I have found is that if you want to understand what's happening, if you want to improve your market awareness and, and really appreciate what's working and what's not, charts are one of the finest ways to uh, really get your head around what's happening. A lot of movements, and I'd say the major averages continue to push higher onward and ever upward, making new highs for the year. We're going to break all of that down here in our market recap. Let's look at the charts, see what happened with the major benchmarks. And overall, a lot of green when we're looking at the front page of your market dashboard. The S&P 500, kind of a slow and steady move to the upside through the course of the day, finishing higher by about 1.2%. That puts the S&P around 44.26%. By the end of the uh, trading day here on Thursday, the Nasdaq composite, not too dissimilar from that. And the Dow as well, actually, all three right about the same sort of in that 1.2 to 1.3 percent gain for the day. Mid caps and small caps up as well. Small caps lag behind just a bit, but overall a pretty nice uh, and pretty nice move higher uh, across the board. Volatility moving higher. And again, I love to point this out. There's, it, we're so programmed to think stocks are doing, you know, are going up. That means volatility is probably going down. Stocks going down. That means volatility is increasing. And that over time, over multiple cycles, has generally been the tendency, right? There's this inverse relationship between the S&P and with the VIX or volatility. This is one of those days that when you look at individual days, it's not always the case, right? Because what you'll find is that stocks can move higher on increasing volatility. They can move lower on lower volatility. Today is one of those days where the S&P is moving higher. The VIX is actually bouncing back above 14. Now, if you missed my conversation yesterday with Sean McLaughlin of All Star Charts, make sure you go back and, and check that one out. We talked a lot about the volatility regime, where the VIX is now versus 2022, and now it's much closer to 2021, sort of a low volatility uh, environment. It's kind of where we're at today. Looking at some other asset classes here very quickly to see what we can uh, find. Interest rates, for the most part, moving lower. Of course, we had the Fed meeting yesterday, so a lot of our discussion was just thinking about, uh, you know, what happened, what we learned, uh, sort of the future path or potential future path of uh, rate hikes or changes in the, uh, in the target rate going forward. For today, bond markets are uh, actually rallying. The TLT was up about 1%. 10-year yields down to around 373. And the long bond yield right around 385. The dollar index down a little bit as well, about 0.6% lower for the UUP. Looking at uh, commodities, commodities overall in the green, although silver was actually narrowly in the red. The GLD, a, a physical gold ETF, was up about 0.7%. The broader commodity ETF like the DBC, uh, all up pretty good as well. Oil prices uh, moving higher. Energy, not the best performer, kind of middle of the pack today, but still up about 1%. Finally, cryptocurrencies, uh, everything I listen to, I feel like uh, besides talking about, you know, narrow leadership and strong performance of the uh, of the AI fueled rally in the uh, in the growth oriented equity benchmarks, it's cryptocurrencies and the regulatory pressures uh, that these are uh, that these are facing. Of course, what you have to remember is day to day. There's a lot of noise. And if you want to find a noisy space, cryptocurrencies are a pretty good place to look because there tends to be a lot of volatility, much more than the average stock. Today, not too bad of a day, actually. And you can see Bitcoin and Ethereum both up today. Ether price is up about 1.1 percent. Bitcoin up about 1.4 percent. Some other mixed uh, results overall. But both Bitcoin and Ethereum, a 
attempting to rotate higher. Again, there are plenty of challenges to sort of the business model, unquote, uh, quote unquote, of, uh, of the cryptocurrency space. But again, I've always found the proof is in the price. Let's focus on what the trends and the momentum shifts are telling us for now, either potentially bouncing off of its 200 day moving average. We'll get to that chart here in a little bit if we have time for it. Finally, in terms of sector rotations, communication services and healthcare pretty much tied for the top performers today. The XLC and the XLV were both up about 1.6%, followed by industrials number three. At the bottom of the list, real estate, a fairly defensive sector, still up about half a percent, followed by consumer discretionary and materials, all up at less than 1%. So, you know, was there a clear offense over defense type of read today? Uh, not necessarily because it was kind of mixed all around, but it's worth noting that 11 out of 11 finishing the day higher than they were yesterday. And when we talk about a narrow advance that has become more of a broader advance, I would say this is, uh, you know, sort of one of those basic ways you can, uh, you can measure that. Is there a clear message of investors getting more offensive, more defensive, clear indication of rotation between uh, some of those sectors? I don't know if necessarily I'm finding that on a day like today. It's more of a sort of rising tides, lifting all boats sort of move. Uh, with the uh, all 11 S&P sectors moving higher. Let's look at the chart of the S&P 500, and you'll see how today's move, again, just pushes further to the upside. 4,300 was such an important level. That's the uh, pink shaded area on our chart, sort of 4,300 to 4,325. This was not just the August 2022 high, although I think that's pretty meaningful. It was also a 61.8% retracement of the way back up from the October 2022 low to the January 2022 high. And one of the things we've talked about here for a number of months is if and when we get to 4,300, 4,325, that's a likely area where you probably stall out because it's such an important resistance level. But if we break that, then there's a lot of daylight above there. You know, further resistance levels are few. 4,600 lines up with the top from the spring, early spring, sort of uh, late winter of 2022. That was sort of the first major peak in the drawdown of 2022. Then we're back up to all-time highs around 4,800 on the S&P 500. Now, if there is a danger sign, it's that we've gone up a lot. And the way I define that is because the RSI, my favorite measure of price momentum, is overextended. The last time we were this overextended was actually well before. This is actually at the end of 2021, if I remember. This is going into the 2020. 21, 2022 peak was the last time we were this overbought uh, as a market. Now, it's not saying that means we're at a top because earlier in that bullish phase, you can have a, a momentum indicator get overbought and just stay up there. What you look for is when the indicator becomes not overbought anymore, right? When it comes out of that overbought region, meaning this is sort of on the watch list for me mentally and looking to see when it rotates back below 70. That day may come, but that day is not today. Looking elsewhere, you know, one of the charts we featured yesterday on the show was the bullish percent index. We've talked about the bullish percent index on the S&P 500. Here we're going to talk about the bullish percent index on the NASDAQ 100. We mentioned this is one of our three and three charts. Just wanted to point out, we talked about will it get above 70 this week? Today it did. Now what this is doing, this is looking at 100 different point and figure charts. Point and figure charts are a classic way, classic way of visualizing trend. Instead of looking at price over time, it's looking at price versus really trend uh, as the x-axis. So uptrends and downtrends, and it's a simple way of measuring how many stocks are in a bullish phase versus a bearish phase. The fact that the bullish percent index is above 70 tells you that 7 out of 10, even more than that, in the Nasdaq 100 are in a buy signal on their point and figure chart. Now, that on its own is not a bad thing. And if you look back, when we've gone above 70, that often has been the beginning of sort of a further move higher. But it's usually the later stages. We're sort of in the 7th, 8th, ninth inning, according to this indicator, because look at what's happened. And we can go further back, but I'm just looking at the last 12 months here. Look at when we've gone above 70 percent and then come back below. Sometimes that's take a couple Days. Sometimes it's taken a couple weeks, but every one of those times we've had at least some sort of pullback. When we talk about the market being overextended, we talk about the potential for a bit of a pullback. Charts like this are the ones that come to mind. Now, these are more leading indicators telling you a top may be nearing. The question is, do we get a confirmation? Do we get a rotation lower? And this just tells me to be waiting for that sort of uh, contrarian sell signal when the market becomes over uh, overheated like this. For now, it's telling you the trend is positive and a lot of stocks are participating. And that's what most breadth conditions, I would say at this point, are sort of in agreement on. 
Let's look at a couple individual names and see uh, some of the stocks that have been on the move, uh, some of the stocks that have been uh, some of the bigger gainers today. One of the biggest gainers uh, is in the home builder group, Lennar Corp. We've talked about this stock before as an example of a, uh, of a strong trend. What's interesting is how orderly of an uptrend it's been, right? Look at how the stock has continued to make higher highs. We've made higher lows. We've often pulled back to an ascending 50-day moving average. That's actually happened a number of times. About a month ago, we were talking about this pullback to the ascending 50-day moving average. If the momentum would remain in a bullish phase, and all of that has indeed played out. We've now rotated back to make a new 52-week high, up about 4.4%, leading the S&P higher. And again, that is a strong group. Year-to-date, one of the better places, certainly outside of the FANG uh, group of stocks. Hard to find a better opportunity probably than, than home builders so far in 2023. At this point, the chart is still telling you that there's further upside. I had a question about Domino's Pizza Group from a, from a client uh, this week, and I just wanted to bring it up. You know, when, when, you, when you see a gap like this today, up 6.5% today, nice move higher, right? I mean, I, absolutely true. But the question is, what has really changed? And I think that's the question I ask on a day like this when a stock has gapped higher. Now, let's take a step back and look at the longer picture on Domino's Pizza Group. This is a stock that has been in a clear downtrend. Now, how would I define that? A couple different ways, right? Just take a step back and, and track with your finger the highs and the lows. And you can see we've been making, over a longer period of time, lower lows and lower highs, really for the last 18 months. Coming off of that high at the end of 2021, it's been pretty much going lower by that definition. We spent most of that time below a descending 200-day moving average. As a matter of fact, a number of times we've rallied within this downtrend and we've either not made it to the 200-day or we've stalled out right there or even just above there uh, at the, uh, in November of last year. So for now, we've rallied. We've gapped higher. That's not bad. The question is, do we have enough to complete the rotation? So things that you may want to look for. Do we get above the 200-day moving average? That would be a start. Do we start making a higher low? The most recent low is actually a double bottom of sorts, right? Testing support around 290 and we've rallied. Put in a higher low, show that buyers are willing to come in before we retest those lows. That's when you can start to declare things as, as uh, more of a bullish rotation on the longer term time frame. Folks, let's take a quick break. We'll be back with today's guest, Doug Ramsey of the Lufo Group. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We so appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close for our show. A couple announcements here before we get our uh, today's guest on the on the air, Doug Ramsey of the Lufo Group. And mainly it's to remind you, our mailbag will be going tomorrow. We'd love to feature one of your questions live on the air. We've received so many great questions over the years about technical indicators, about particular buy and sell signals, about the stock charts platform about market dynamics, investor psychology, whatever it is that's on your mind, we're here to point you in the right direction. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We are on Twitter at finalbarsctv, and we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'd love to hear from you. We hope to answer your question live on the air on Friday's show. I want to welcome on today's guest, Doug Ramsey. Doug's the chief investment officer at the Luthol Group, coming to us from Minneapolis, Minnesota. We have a mutual connection through the Ohio State University, Doug. It's a pleasure to have a, a Buckeye on the, uh, on the air. How are you, Doug? Are you doing okay? I'm doing well. How about you, Dave? I'm good. It's good to see you. And it was great to see you in New York for the, uh, for the CMT Symposium. It was great to reconnect with, uh, with you and many uh, at, that, uh, at that event. I'd love to talk to you. Obviously, a lot of question marks. This uh, 2023, an incredibly strong year for the benchmarks. A lot of people have critiqued it as sort of been a narrow-led market, but things are starting to shift. When you look at the market conditions today, what's your assessment of where we're at? Uh, you're right. I mean, things have broadened. Uh, the market started out the year uh, with something that actually generated some bread thrusts. Uh, and that turned some of our work positive enough to lift our major trend index. You know, we've talked about that before, Dave, but the MTI was negative throughout almost all of 2022. So that worked out well for us, but went neutral uh, because of some of this strengthening technical work in January. And it stayed there. And the surprise is, you know, given the strength in those cap weighted indices that you just you haven't seen the follow through with small and mid caps and just sort of like equally weighted market averages are a good way to measure internal health. Those have really been lagging. So, you know, to have a rally of this size and it's probably, you know, 23, 24% now off of the lows without the participation, you know, especially if that is supposedly a major bear market low uh, from last October, just very unusually narrow behavior. 
Speaking of which, let's do a bit of a history lesson. You, you shared some charts with me that I want to show to everyone and, and talk through it. We've talked about the narrow leadership, but really, you know, is the improvement in small caps an encouraging sign or not? Talk us through these charts that you have and, and let's, let's uh, sort of make the assessment together if we could. Yeah, you know, I would say that generally improving breadth is a positive. So I'm just I'm giving you some counter examples here just <laughs> to illustrate that, uh, you know, it's just it's not a matter of just checking off the boxes. The market's mm. just a little bit more complex uh, than that. But when we got those uh, those big small cap days and today they lagged a little bit. But when we got those two small cap, uh, very strong days within the last couple of weeks, it sort of reminded me of something that we saw at the tail end of the tech bubble, 98, 99. Small caps were just awful in 98 and 99. And then they essentially made up two years of underperformance in just a couple of months. And that relative strength top there sort of you know uh in in early march of 2000 coincided with the nasdaq top and then the s p went up for a couple more weeks and then that was that so it was a case in which and i remember that very clearly you know valuations were through the roof at least for the mega caps and the mega cap tech stocks uh that sounds somewhat uh familiar i would say uh but you know many technicians were sort of hooked in by that broadening of the market at the very tail end. And it turned out to be a contrarian signal. And then the next chart is an instance within that 2000 to 2002 bear market where you had small cap strength beginning in September of 01, uh, right through and even beyond uh, sort of the final bear market rally peak in March or April of that year. And then that last leg down was was vicious. That was more than a that was a 35 percent decline into uh, October of 02. So, again, another example where the breadth studies were really perking up over a multi month period. And it turned out to be a. Uh, Turned out to be a trick that the market played on us. Uh, and then the middle of 2008, uh, again, people look back and think about the subprime crisis and think, oh, yeah, that was pretty obvious that we were in recession uh, in mid-07. And well, you know what? No, it wasn't. Um, there was a lot of conflicting data even through the middle of 2008. And I remember it well. Small caps were doing well. I don't have the chart here, but the transportation stocks were outperforming massively yeah. uh, into the middle of 2008. And uh, remember, the, the recession started right at the beginning of 08. The official business cycle peak was in December. Uh, very unusual action to see breadth and the small caps uh, acting strong during the first eight or nine months of the recession. And then, of course, the relative strength, strength peak there in the small caps, that bottom clip is... Uh, the Russell versus the S&P 500, that was right around where uh, Lehman failed in the middle of September. Of course, the rest the rest is history. And of course, um, now with the, the latest move, you know, the, this little uh, flicker of life we've seen in small caps on a relative basis is nothing like those other examples. But mm. if it were to continue, I think you're going to see more and more of uh, the technical people uh, warm up to this market, those that already haven't. And I'm just illustrating here. And, and I guess, uh, again, normally the broadening of the market is a positive sign, but I'm just mm. looking at this in the context of the monetary signals. I mean, this melt up we've seen in the mega caps has got to be the most impressive I've seen in the context of the monetary tightness going on. You know, we're shrinking the money supply, M2 money supply. 5% year over year. Of course, the yield curve is uh, inverted dramatically. And we just paused in a series of rate hikes that looks like it's going to continue if the Fed follows through on what they told us yesterday. This is this is fascinating. One of, my, one of my analysts at Fidelity, Mark Dibble, used to say charts are the truth yeah. serum for the markets. And I love how, you know, a lot of times there's yeah. sort of these general things, right? Small caps outperform, it's bullish, they underperform, it's bearish. But not always the case, as you, as you showed us some great examples of. Let's talk a little bit more, more about the Fed, if we could, right? Fed, Fed yeah. meeting this week, uh, you know, taking a pause that I think a lot of people sort of expected the market was pricing in. Did you hear anything that changes your perspective, makes you more optimistic, pessimistic about prospects for risk assets going in through the uh, through the summer months into the fall? No, I, I, I didn't. And I even question... Uh 
you know, how many more hikes they're going to be able to, to implement. Mm. I, I just think what's already been done has most likely baked a recession of some depth. Uh, and I can't really handicap that in advance, but I, I think it's, it's sort of baked in just, it's this yield curve inversion. And again, people focus on just the inversion, which by the way, we define it happened last November. Mm. And I know there are folks that look at the 10 year minus the two year. I mean, that happened a year ago on April fool's day. Um, but really the inversion by the way we measure it occurred seven months ago the, the typical lead time, and um, this is the spread between the 10 year bond yield and three month bill rate, typical yield curve inversion before the peak in the business cycle is 10 months. We're seven months into it. The longest right. uh, lead time has been 16 months. I mean, if that were to repeat itself, we'd be looking out until March of 2024 for the business cycle peak. I don't think we're going to hang on that long, but anything is possible. Uh, but there is, we actually wrote about this on our latest, uh, the June Green Book. Typically, there is an intervening rally between that yield curve inversion, again, you know, early part of last November, into uh, the final peak before we lapse in the recession. And with this move that we've had this week, that rally now is like beyond what we would normally expect following the inversion of the yield curve. But I still mm. think it's mean. Again, it's not just the inversion. It's the fact that it's lasted so long and gotten yeah. so deep. I think that's very powerful. And the lag effect is still to come. It's, it's interesting. You mentioned the major trend index. And I know from, again, from my Fidelity days, reading the Green Book faithfully every month and really focusing on what the major trend index was telling us. For those that aren't familiar with Luthold and, and your work there, can you just briefly describe what is the major trend index? What, is the, what are the conditions now? And why is it constructive in terms of the, the trend in the market? Uh, it is, it's currently neutral, neutral after having okay. been negative for almost all of last year. And uh, so it, it's a mix. We have four categories, valuation, cyclical, which cyclical is sort of a broad category to capture monetary policy, inflation pressures, you know, earnings, momentum, things of that nature, more fundamental and related to the business cycle. Uh, investor sentiment, typically viewed in a, a contrarian fashion. Now, that's a category that was supportive. In other words, there was a lot of fear from investors, which was a, a, a contrary positive coming into the year. That's pretty much a, evaporated. With the latest weekly MTI reading, that sentiment category actually ticked negative. Mm -hmm. So that's some fuel that was there coming into the year that I think is now gone. And then the technical category is positive just by one tick. It can go from minus five to plus five. It's only positive uh, plus one, which is surprising, again, in light of how strong the headline indices have been this year. It tells you there's a lot of, I won't call it rot, but there's a lot of underperformance <laughs> underneath uh, the surface. So it's it's way to the evidence. And I will yeah. say that it's been, you know, the technical work has kept us from being more cautious than we have mm -hmm. been. I mean, we use the MTI to help guide the net equity exposure in our tactical strategies. Uh, those strategies have a lot of latitude to hold between 30 and 70 percent equity exposure. We're above the midpoint right now with this rally, 52 percent. Um, so I, that technical work has helped out. And we already uh, uh, you already mentioned Mark Dibble at Fidelity. I mean, he mentioned something uh, to me, and it was a little bit before uh, COVID that and of course, you know, monetary policy, uh, we've just seen some things we've never seen before in the last, well, really 13 years, but more specifically, the uh, the MMT, the modern monetary theory we, we saw associated with the COVID rescue. But, you know, even before that, Mark's opinion was, you know, I think we're going into a golden age of technical analysis just because of how unusual the policy cocktail is. And I think that turned out to be uh, very prescient. And of course, we haven't even talked about fiscal, but we're running a seven and a half percent deficit as a percentage of GDP at full employment. Mm. I mean, just the size of the structural deficit is is incredible. Yeah. Uh, so it needs to, I, I think, put some degree of uh, weight, uh, in our case, probably a larger weight than in the past on just the action of the market itself. 
Doug, this, is, uh, this has been a blast. I really appreciate it. I feel like we could talk for hours about all of these different themes. We and we'll have, to, we'll have to spread it out through a couple discussions, but I will very much look forward to having you back on the show and uh, wish you the best, Doug. Thanks a lot, Dave. That's Doug Ramsey. Doug's the chief investment officer at the Luthal Group, and he mentioned things like the Green Book, the Major Trend Index. I know working with some very successful money managers would rely heavily on uh, Steve Luthold and Doug and the team there to really uh, understand what was happening, combining the strengths of these different disciplines. It, did, it was not lost on me that I heard Doug Ramsey say on the air how important the technical component was. Uh, I'll take it. And the great take is always there from Doug Ramsey at uh, the Luthold Group in Minneapolis. We've got to wrap the show, folks, and go to the three and three. Let's talk about three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. You know, I was thinking a lot about the bullish percent index. Anytime we're talking about market breadth and I see something start to make extreme signals, I have to start to look back, just like I think Doug Ramsey brilliantly did, thinking about small versus large and how this relates to previous rally phases, previous uh, weaker market phases. What is, where are we at now relative to where we've been? Here we're looking at the QQQ, and the second panel down is the NASDAQ 100 bullish percent index. We talked about this a little earlier. Then at the bottom, it's the bullish percent index for the technology sector. Now, we run these bullish percent index uh, uh, data series for uh, the major averages, uh, some non-U.S. indexes, by the way, but also some U.S. sectors and groups that are the most meaningful. If you look at the information technology sector, it's right around 84%. I've highlighted previous times over the last uh, 12 to 18 months when we've gone above 80%. And you can see that it's pretty close to picking out all of the major turning points or all the major ends of the major rallies that we've seen uh, over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. I think this is the concern, right? Now, again, I don't like to base a strategy off of we've gone up a lot, so we probably need to go down. I think that sort of mentality keeps you out of things that have worked and continue to work. And I don't I want to avoid, uh, you know, just missing out on, on uh, strong trends that persist. But it does tell me to keep it. It does tell me to keep an eye on a chart like this to look for those rotations lower for not not uh, for now, not quite yet, but an important chart maybe to watch going forward as some of these sectors that have been leading are really overextended based on some of those methodologies. Chart number two is looking at the material sector. This is a chart that I like to include in my monthly chart review for my market misbehavior premium members. We look at the 11 and S&P sectors on a weekly basis, and we look at the relative strengths. So this first panel from the top is the relative performance of the material sector versus the S&P 500. Then we just have a weekly chart of the S&P weekly bar chart. At the bottom, the price momentum. And thinking of these three uh, uh, data series together is what's most important. But the most valuable one, in my opinion, is the relative strength. I did an interview earlier today, the Financial Sense Pop podcast with uh, Jim Poplava, and it's a fantastic uh, show. I'd encourage you to, uh, to check out. He asked me about the material sector. Basically, commodities have been you know, certainly struggling on a relative basis. Is it time yet? And what I basically told him was it's a great opportunity to focus on relative strength. The good thing about technical analysis is it will tell you when the trends are shifting. And I would say when you're looking at sector rotation, when you're looking at the 11 sectors and trying to gauge relative performance or relative opportunity between those 11, focus on the relative strength line. This is what I think Julius DeKempener does so beautifully with his RRG charts. This is what I think uh, you know, Sam Stovall did so well writing, literally writing the book on sector rotation. And this is why I think relative strength on the XLB is so important. The answer is it's not turning up enough yet. It's just starting. In the last couple of weeks, you're seeing materials, even some energy starting to bounce a little bit, but not enough to really rotate. But this is the type of chart I would be watching on a weekly basis to track those moves and don't miss when those things start to really outperform. Finally, Ethereum. I mentioned we'd look at the Ether chart. We had to save it for the very end here, but it's worth noting that as Bitcoin and as Ethereum have come down, obviously a lot of regulatory challenges, issues with places like Coinbase and Binance and others. What are the charts telling us? Well, Ether has pulled back to an ascending 200-day moving average. The last time it tested its 200-day moving average was at the March low. It's also oversold as of yesterday. Is there a bounce off this 50% retracement level around 1600 and a move higher? Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Special thank you to Doug Ramsey of the Luthold Group joining us from Minneapolis. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a good night.